In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. You may be seated. Uh, well, hey, good morning. For those of you uh, who were expecting Adam Scherz, Advent is a season of surprises. And so, surprise, <laughs> I'm not Adam Scherz, my name is Jason Brown, and uh, it's been some time since I've been able to come in here and share, so I thought it would be appropriate uh, and important to introduce myself again. Uh, I serve as the executive minister here at Broadway. Uh, typically, I am hanging out with our students at the 930 Rhythm Service there, and uh, while I miss them, I'm super excited to be here with you. I'm, I'm super excited to do what I am about to do next. And I don't want you to be uncomfortable, but, but this is a place of truth telling. And I have been unable to do this for the 13 years almost that I have been here. So prepare yourselves for this. My Louisville Cardinals, don't lie, this is, this is truth telling, all right? My Louisville Cardinals are the number one men's basketball team in this country. Hey, okay, all right. I was a little worried about that. I was afraid people were gonna leave. Uh, but uh, UK fans, take heart. It is also a season of miracles. So <laughs> good luck to you. Uh, I hope, I, this is a place of truth telling. I, absolutely, I, actually, I hope you do well, I hope you do well. Uh, just, just not better than Louisville. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to lean in to all things Advent with you. Now, full-on confession, um, Advent is a season of surprises. It's a season of miracles. It's a season of hope. Um, but there is a tendency, at least within me, to, to rush to those, right? To rush to the places where surprise happens and hope happens and avoid everything else. And, and when that happens, this season becomes more about my comfort. It becomes more about a season of comfort rather than a season of miracles and surprise. And, and as I thought about this, I thought about all of the ways in which like, I pursue my own comfort. Like, like ways in which every single day I'm, I'm, I'm sharing what, what like, I want for Christmas. Right? Like everybody wants something for Christmas. Um, but the reality probably is that we all can't get what we want for Christmas. Not everybody can be, you know, the number one team in the nation, right? But like not just sports, right, but even like in my own life and in the life of my family, how often I pursue my, my own comfort, uh, particularly, particularly in this season, right? Like, like we, we all pursue our own comfort um, on a regular day, but particularly this season, right? Like so when, when, uh, when my family goes to family functions in uh, this season, right? I, I, am, I am stressed out at the pursuit of my own comfort, right? So for example, like you all, you all be the kids, 
I'll be the dad, full on in the car, we're in the car, right, we're going to some family gathering, I'm in the front seat, looking back, full on dad mode, pulling down the glasses, like, look here, children, here's what we're not talking about today. <laughs> we're not talking about the fight we just had, all right? And we're not talking about what, the things we said to each other, all right, we're gonna be happy. <laughs> Do you hear me? <laughs> Right? And, and even beyond that, like, I get, I get, um, I don't know if angry is the right word, but, like, distressed when my comfort is interrupted or, or, or I see, or when I see a path to my comfort and, and it is blocked. So, for example, I was shopping for my wife for a Christmas gift. Really, I just saw an online ad. Uh, <laughs> that's for truth. It's the truth. And it was for a massage gun. Have you seen these things? Like, um, I don't know how to describe it, except like it's a massage, it's like a, it's like a gun and it has a thing that like, you know, goes into your, your skin, your sore muscles. And uh, my wife has um, this year taking, taken up running and I was like, well, that's the, that's the perfect gift. Like, and uh, my, I've learned over the course of our marriage that my wife doesn't like surprises. And so I said, no, Dana, found the perfect gift for you. She's like, what is it? It's like, it's, it's a massage gun, you know? So like, when you go on your runs, and you come back, and you're like, oh, I'm so sore, you can get out this massage gun. <laughs> and she was like, I don't want that. <laughs> like, oh. My comfort was interrupted. And if we're not careful, and if, if we're not careful, uh, this season can become a time when we pursue comfort. I, th I think it's more than that. You know it's more than that. Uh, Advent is something bigger than that. What happens when we pursue comfort is we avoid discomfort. When we pursue comfort, we avoid awkwardness. This is like when you go to the family gathering and there's like the crazy uncle there and you're like, I would rather not talk to you. So I'm gonna say hello and then I'm gonna walk right over here to where you're not. Like that's, right, like that is, that, that is you pursuing your comfort, avoiding awkwardness. But Advent, if you learn nothing else about Advent, learn this, that Advent is not about avoidance. Advent is the moment, it's the season where we remember the moment in which God awkwardly engages rather than avoid. God who re rejects his own comfort to awkwardly engage us, to put on awkwardness, to put on flesh, and to engage the world he created. There's, there's lots, I mean, let's be real, there's lots of awkward stuff in scripture, but there's maybe nobody more awkward, no one person more awkward than John the Baptist. And, and, and the way that Matthew presents John in chapter 3, so, so Matthew sets up the story, chapter 1, chapter 2, like this is Jesus. Uh, Matthew reaches back to the generations. He, he brings us forward. He introduces Jesus. Chapter 2, center stage, here's Jesus. And then like hits pause and switches the story to, this, to, the, to the awkward uncle, right? To, to the awkward uncle who, like, I picture him as this. So this is Jason. This is not scripture. But, like, this wild-eyed, gray-haired dude, like, just saying what, what we would hear as nonsense. And the, the, the awkward guy's like, oh, man, like, John the Baptist is going to be there. What are we going to do when he talks to us? Yeah, you're going to have to pull me aside. Be like, tell me you need some help in the kitchen because I'd rather not talk to John the Baptist, Right? And yet, Matthew zooms in on John the Baptist and describes him awkwardly. Describes him as uh, someone who wears clothes made of camel's hair and uh, like scavenges for his food. Uh, specifically, he says that he eats locusts and that he eats wild honey. Like, this, this, is, this is crazy. Uh, so... Uh, full on, full on confession. In the safety of this space, 
um, I have, this is not a new show, but a show that I have recently discovered, and honestly, like, I'm, I'm captivated by it. Um, it is called, and you can't judge me for this, it is called Naked and Afraid. Have you seen this show? <laughs> it's an incredible show. It's an incredible show. Uh, the, way, the way that it works, don't judge me, the way that it works, <laughs> the way that it works is they take two people and they, they put them in the, the wilderness. Sometimes it's like a desert, sometimes it's a forest, sometimes it's a jungle. They, they take them and they give them, like they can take two items. And so typically like somebody will bring a machete and, and, and somebody will bring a, a fire starter. Sometimes it's different, but that's kind of usually what it is. And, and then, and here's where it gets kind of awkward, uh, they have them strip down. That's the naked and naked and afraid. And they have to survive, they have to survive in the wilderness for 21 days. And, and inevitably, it's like the first day, you know, they're, they have these cameras, and the first day, they're like, oh, I'm so excited. I am a survivalist. I have three kids. I'm doing it for them. It's going to be awesome. I'm so excited. And uh, that's like day one. And then day two, they're like, we got our shelter built. Things are going really well. We're doing this thing. And then day 10, they're like, oh, God. What have I done? This is, this is horrible. What they do is they, stri- like they are stripped of every single support thing that they have, right? Like, like there's nowhere to go buy supplies. Like they're not in the middle of uh, the this, this city where there is safety or, or where there's opportunity to get something that they forgot. They're out in the wilderness stripped of every single support network, stripped of every single support structure. There they are. And, and what they have is what they can find. And that is where John the Baptist is at. When Matthew pulls back the curtain on John the Baptist, he, he doesn't say, uh, yeah, and he, was, and he was safe. And people went to him because he was safe. Uh, he doesn't say uh, he was comfortable. And people went to him to find comfort. He says he was in the wilderness like a voice calling in the wilderness without support structure, without even clothes, without even food. Matthew says it this way, switching the scene. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea or the wilderness of Judea and saying, if his location isn't comfortable, then his message is also uncomfortable. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who has spoke, was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. The thing that echoes across the desert is John the Baptist saying, repent. Which essentially is calling out to his hearers, and by extension us, and saying, Strip down. Strip down. All of your support structure, all of your support network, uh, everything that you have done to make yourself comfortable, strip it away and come to the desert. And in the midst of this proclamation, in the midst of this invitation, there is incredible awkwardness because John the Baptist straddles the line between what is and what can be. In this awkward moment, John the Baptist rests just like us in Advent, really just like us in life, between the perils of what is and the possibilities of what can be. There are two things happening as John the Baptist cries out. Number one is folks are coming and listening to him and um, embracing the possibilities of what can be. But in the midst of that, John the Baptist is full on aware of the perils of what is because the Pharisees are coming as well. And he delivers like this A-plus level trash talk to them by, by saying to them, by, by like straight up calling them snakes, like going so far as to say, who, who warned you to come here? Why are you here? He calls them the brood of vipers, the son of snakes, like, and just keep going, the son of of Satan. Like, this is A-plus level trash talk. Like, I've played a lot of sports, 
And never, ever have I said to someone, you are the son of Satan. <laughs> and yet, John the Baptist here says this to them. John the Baptist cries out an invitation, but it's not an invitation to comfort. Matthew goes to great lengths to place John in the literal desert, in the literal wilderness. And as we read John's invitation, it is an invitation to our wilderness. It is an invitation to the desert. It's an invitation to the desert where disappointment exists. It's an invitation to, 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 to resting in the desert where, where disappointment uh, is definitive. Where, where we look back and say, oh, if that, if, if that one thing had changed, if I had said something differently, or if I had done something differently, then, then this would change, and then this would be totally different, and, and maybe this would actually also be different, and then this would be okay. In the desert, there are disappointments. And, and, and also in the desert, also over here, there, in, in the desert, there is distress. There, there are things that currently just uh, mess us up. There are things that, 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 that currently dominate our attention and, 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 that, and, and that make us worry like, oh, you know, this, this is happening and I don't know what I should do. And maybe I should do this, but I'm not sure. And oh, what happens if they do this? Like distress exists in the desert. John is inviting us not, to, not just to distress and disappointment, but also into the desert of despair. The place where we live when we can't change it, no matter what. The place where we can't go back. The place where life is what it is, even when we wish it wasn't. That no matter how hard we try, we can't undo death. We can't undo despair. John's invitation is not one to comfort. John's invitation to the desert to repent is to come face to face with despair, with disappointment, with distress. And the one thing that does not exist in the desert are disguises. What John is inviting us to do, what John is inviting his hearers and us to do is to come to the desert, to take off our disguise, to not zoom past the discomfort, to not zoom past the disappointment, to not zoom past the despair, to not zoom past the distress. John invites us to come to the desert. Now listen, there are no Christmas carols about the desert. We don't want to live in the wilderness. We would rather avoid it at, at all costs. I know in my own life there are things that I do in particular to, to avoid the desert, to not be disappointed, to, to, to avoid despair, to reject distress, to not talk to that person, to not deal with that situation, to extract myself from an uncomfortable situation. And yet, the invitation of John the Baptist is to come to the desert. So I want to invite you to the desert today. I want to invite you for a moment to rest not wallow, but to rest in distress. To rest in disappointment. To rest in despair.
And as you go to the desert, as you reflect on disappointment and distress and despair, you realize that you are not the only one in the desert. Because as the story continues, Jesus comes to the desert. Jesus himself discovers us in the desert. You are not the only one in the desert. And as you wrestle with stress and despair and disappointment, Jesus himself comes to the desert with us, discovers us in the desert and says to us, there's enough grace for the desert. There is enough grace for the desert. There's enough grace for disappointment. There's enough grace for distress. There's enough grace for despair. There's enough grace for the desert. So whatever desert, whatever wilderness, whatever disappointment, despair, distress you find yourself in this morning, whatever one of those you have avoided, whatever one of those you have pretended does not exist, hear these words. There is enough grace for the desert. There's enough grace for the desert. I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that from more voices than just mine. And so I'm going to pray in just a moment, but after I pray, I want to invite you, not right now, but invite you after we pray, to stand up and to tell each other as you pass the peace of Jesus, to legitimately pass the peace of Jesus and say, there is enough grace for the desert. I'm going to pray for us to invite Jesus, to invite the Holy Spirit into every individual desert represented here. And then after that, invite you to stand and make those words echo throughout this room that there's enough grace for the desert. Let's pray together. God, no matter where we find ourselves this morning, you find us. And your presence is here. So God, may you discover us in the desert. May we put aside our disguises. And God, may we hear your whisper in our hearts that there is enough grace for the desert. God, would you send your Holy Spirit here and may those words echo off of your presence in this room that there is enough grace for the desert. Amen.